Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. This show is sponsored by Kits Keep In Touch Systems, a two-time international award-winning marketing suite, as well as REM Real Estate Magazine, Canada's premier monthly magazine for real estate. Learn more about our sponsors by visiting my site, mindshare101.com. And while you're there, be sure to download your free copy of my book, The Ultimate Marketing Bundle, as well as learn more about our one-to-one coaching and keynote speaking. Today's episode is number 257. So the past few weeks of the show, well, no different than usual. We've had some amazing guests join us on the show. Um, As we look back on that time over the past three guests that we've had, we were joined by Johnny Goldmaker, who is a content creator, um, what I call the content wizard. This guy helped a couple of YouTube channels grow to, um, well, one channel grew to over 7 million followers. Um, another one had a video that went over 32 million views. This guy knows what it takes to create content. And we had him on the show. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, what does it take? What does it take to create content that's actually going to, you know, garner attention from people, that people are going to listen to, that people are going to follow, that people are going to want to come back to? And in a lot of the learnings that we do together on this show, um, and typically through, you know, through our training and our coaching and whatnot, we talk about the aspect around content creation. I've given you tips around that. One thing that he had said to me, because I said to him, you know, at one point, hey, I would like to have, you know, 6 million followers on my YouTube channel. I'd love to have a video that goes over 32 million views. And he said to me, he goes, Dave, you don't need that. You just need to find a thousand true fans. So I thought to myself, I go, you know, from an audience size perspective, and as we talk about it on a regular basis around your contact list and how big that list should be, I typically tell you that list should be somewhere between 200 and 700 people. Now, this is not your, your online followers from social media and YouTube and whatnot. What I'm talking to is your actual main contact list. The one that's in your CRM. The one that we call group number one, and that's where we get most of our business from. Now, with that, when you put the two in perspective with each other and you, you sort of compare the two, he's saying a thousand true fans. And I'm saying to you, you know, somewhere between 200 to 700 people. And if you're meeting one new person every single day, that's 365 new people a year. So the numbers seem to really line up. We don't need thousands and thousands of people. What we need is we need people that are going to be, well, connected to us. We're going to have a relationship with. Um, they're going to trust us. They're going to know who we are. Those are the people we're looking for. So we had a great conversation around audience size, expectations, what to expect from our content, what to expect from when we're putting, you know, putting, putting words out there. You know, um, listenership should we be focused on likes and views and, and again, downloads. And they're all metrics that we can follow. But much like Johnny was telling us, this comes down to creating content that you're going to pay, pay attention to and then being consistent about your execution. Kind of just like we do here on the My Share Podcast. Anyways, great episode. I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to the episode with Johnny. Um, as you're thinking about content, as you're thinking about creating content for the new year, um, great episode to tune into. After that, we had Daryl King on. Now, Daryl's been in the business for over 30 plus years, maybe 40 plus years at this point. Um, he's a top producing realtor. He's a veteran in the game. You know, we, we, we discussed all things market. Um, he gave us insights on what he thought about the market and what the market is, is really up to. Is it a good market, a bad market? You know, what's this market going to do to people that are in the industry? I also asked him, because he's been through many markets, around, you know, th- this aspect around like hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Last time you went through a market like this, what was it that you noticed about the market that you always said to yourself after the fact, like, hey, wait a second. I should have seen this earlier. I should have known that this was going to happen. And and what opportunities might we see ahead? And so he gave us a glimpse, almost in what I'd say into the future. But he also, again, very well positioned us for what's going on right now. And what is it going to take to survive? And then most recently, I had uh, realtor Lily Rudgie. Um, Lily has been in real estate for, for uh, a few years now. Um... We talked together about how to be more efficient and deliberate with your time. Now, Lily's also a coaching client of mine, and we've been working together for probably about a year now, and I'm not going to let you into all the struggles she was having when she first decided to start coaching, but one thing we know, and one thing I recall, is she always used to say, like, I don't know how you get it all done. 
And this is the best part of the entire change here now is that in working with her and helping her develop these systems and processes of, you know, how to run our business and what we're doing, she's now getting it all done and she's getting it done and more. And then when something comes up, she knows exactly how to deal with it. And that right there is a big part of the system and process that we work on on a regular basis with our coaching clients is how can we be more deliberate and efficient with our time? Because we all have a lot to do in a day. But if we're not taking the time to schedule accordingly, if we're not taking the time to plug in what's got to be done, hey, it's going to be tough to get it done. And I had another client of mine who may or may not be listening to this episode here, and you'll know exactly who you are if you are, but, uh, you know, said to me, you know, labeled out all these things he had to do in a day and then said, and then the rest of the day is a write-off. I said, a write-off? He says, well, yeah, like I I just, I've got so many more things to do, but I'm not going to be able to get them done because I had to do all these things. Now, I'll tell you, without sharing the details, that all the things that he had to do, it was incredibly productive. So I said to him, I said, why would it be a write-off? He says, well, I don't have any more time in the day. I just, I can't get it all done. I said, but that's life. We've only got 24 hours in a day. There's only so much time we can dedicate to putting work in. We've got personal, we want to sleep, we want to eat. You got to use the washroom. Like, there's only so many hours in a day to get things done. And this is where I come back to everybody about the scheduling. And again, with Lily, as we talked about it, being more efficient and deliberate with your time. So she was a great example. It was a great, great episode discussing um, discussing exactly that. You, you know, listening to it, you'll be able to put yourself in her shoes. You'll be able to understand, you know, where some of the challenges and where some of the struggles were. But you're also going to hear her story and her journey to really figuring it out. And I am just super proud to say that I can tell the light bulb has gone on. I can tell that there's a complete focus on that schedule. And hey, when you're focused on that schedule, the one thing we know is those goals, all those things you want to achieve, all the stuff you want to get done in a day, it gets done. And then you feel good. Then you feel in control. And as she said, it's an adrenaline rush to start checking things off the list. So go back to those three episodes that we've got on the podcast. Um, Tune in. Enjoy them. As always, if you've got comments, if you've got questions, uh, please reach out to me anytime. If you've got suggestions for somebody that should be on the show or maybe you want to be on the show, um, reach out to me as well. We're always looking to hear from from our listeners, and I'm I'm just super grateful that you're here. Of course, if you haven't yet, I'll throw it out there. Um, iTunes, uh, if you're listening to it on iTunes, Please go ahead, give us a nice little review on iTunes, five stars. Uh, t- tell us how much you love the show. It it, uh, it definitely means a lot to us. And of course, of course, it helps our ratings. So uh, all that being said, let's get into today's episode um, as we talk about three factors impacting your real estate business right now. Now, the last time we did a solo episode, as we talk about, you know, factors impacting your real estate business right now, the last time we talked about, uh, or we did this episode together, um, you know, just you and me, I like these ones, we talked about the current market, and I had mentioned that we were moving into a buyer's market. Well, I think it's evident. I think it's official now. We are officially in that buyer's market, and and I know that there there are some people that are busy out there. Um, and there are many more that are not right now. And and I got to say, I am incredibly proud to say that for most of my clients that I'm speaking to, most of them seem to have a lot of traction happening. You know, and the same thing I said to a client yesterday, when you put in the effort, you get the results. When you are focused on the things that you want in life, when you are focused on, you know, uh, self-development, when you are focused on making yourself better, good things seem to happen. And it's really easy to sit back and think to ourselves, well, you know, I, I, I know, I know, I know, but I got all this other stuff to do, or it's not happening fast enough, or I don't feel it. It's a day-by-day journey, it, one day at a time. In fact, the way we break it down, it's like one, one minute at a time, one hour at a time, right? Because if you can win the minute, you get closer to winning the hour. If you win the hour, you get closer to winning the, you know, the morning. You get, win the morning, you get closer to winning the day. And well, you've heard me say this before, right? Win the day, win the week, win the week, win the month, win the month, win the year. But it's got to be one day at a time, one minute at a time. And so as we think about this and we think about, again, what's going on in the market and we think about, you know, um, if you're having successes or not, I will say it again to everybody, okay? And, And this ain't my line, but, you know, what goes up must come down. What goes down 
must go up. And so looking ahead, I'm going to continue to say it, there is a ton of opportunity coming for everybody. But it is about what you do right now that's going to position you for that. Remember, the work you do today is the is 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 what's going to make the impact for, you know, weeks down the road, a few months down the road. And again, at this exact moment in time as we're doing all of our planning with our clients and we're starting to look back on the data, on the metrics that we've been keeping all year of, you know, sources of the deals and how many deals and and timing of the deals and, you know, kind of in conjunction with like the IPAs, the income producing activities that we're doing, we can see those, those, those bar graphs, right? Call it like activity versus results. Now we can tell if you're doing the activities, people are getting the results. And when we're not getting the results, well, there's a direct correlation to that. We can tell that the activities aren't happening. So again, as we look at that now, we think about the opportunity that is coming. Think about what you are doing right now to make that happen. Again, all of those income producing activities that we just need to chip away at the block on a daily basis. Okay. Because if you're doing that, when this opportunity comes, and I I do believe it's coming, I believe we're walking again, we're walking into a market into 2024 that's going to be tougher than 23. I really do. So brace for it. Well, what do I do? We don't just sit there holding on and waiting, bracing for it in this case means like grab the bull by the horns and do something. Well, what? Well, I think I've said it 17 times on this show already, and we've only been on for about 10 minutes together. (laughs) Make the calls, do the social, build the mind share with people. The more conversations you have, the more relationships you build, the more opportunity you will create. And again, that opportunity, when you have those clients that are going to need to get out of their mortgages, they will call. That opportunity, when people start to see that potentially maybe prices are starting to level a little bit and they feel more comfortable to jump back in, or maybe they're seeing that people need to get out of their mortgages, so there's more opportunity coming. Well, the ones that are ready to go with cash and the ones that know you're there, one plus one equals two, you get the deal. But again, you got to do it now. You can't wait for the flag to be raised and go, oh, I got it. I'm going to start now because at that point you're late. Always preparing, always being ready to go. So look, let, let, let's discuss these three factors that, that are impacting your business right now and what to do about them. Okay, factor number one, people are on the fence. We know that. No big re- revelation, but this is like the biggest factor impacting you right now. People are on the fence. And what are they saying? (laughs) Simply put, I am just going to wait. Well, what are you waiting for? Well, you know, I'm waiting for the prices to come down. I'm waiting for the interest rates to come down. And that's why they're waiting. It's just because everything, like rates are up. And then, you know, I mean, that's probably the biggest factor right now in terms of what we're, you know, what we're saying here, why people are waiting. But again, when I say like, what are you waiting for? I mean, look, let's go into this deeper, okay? We were in a seller's market at a time. Life was good if you had a listing. You were sitting on a gold mine. And when you had that, if you priced it accordingly, you could drive enough traffic and marketing to people, you you know, driving enough traffic through your marketing, pardon me, that's going to bring people in to see that property. And if enough people like that property, we know, I don't have to tell you, but I'll say it anyways, multiple offers. And therefore, that price that we listed at, we ended up selling over asking, which means... We made a lot of money, and this is a good thing. Times were good. Things were good. Now, when we look at today, though, being in a buyer's market, there's not that many people shopping. People aren't out there. They're just not. Again, everybody's very reserved. And I hear from a lot of my clients that open houses right now, for the most part, they're like ghost towns. There's just not a lot of people going out there. Now, pro tip on that point right there. Um, as we talk about the IPAs, okay, and, and I'm, you know, sidebar for just a quick second here. So we talk about IPAs and we talk about, you know, the, again, the income producing activities, the things that I need to do on a daily basis to, to, to drive more business. One of the things that I suggest to you, and I get this question a lot, Dave, what should I be doing? Again, work your contact list and meet one new person a day. Figure out how to meet somebody. Where? We can talk about those, okay? But specific to this right now, as we talk about the open house, that's one of the places of where. 
So a pro tip here is always, always have a sign-in mechanism at your open house. We want contact info no matter what. So incentivize them to fill out the form. Maybe you're going to give away a, a Starbucks card. Maybe you're going to give away a Tim's card. Maybe, you know, something like a, I don't know, an LCBO card, whatever. Have something. Hey, fill this out for a chance to, uh, to be entered into a free draw for only the people walking through today. Which could say to people like, you know, and one of the questions I might ask was like, how many people walk through? I, well, we've only had a few people today. Oh, amazing. I'll fill that out. My chances to win are much higher. So we're going to incentivize people to give us their contact info. Now, I know what you're thinking. A lot of people may not want to give that contact information. I got you. But at the same time, too, you're allowing a stranger to walk through your client's home. Don't you think your client might want to know who that is? In fact, let's do this. If they do say no, say, I'm sorry, it's seller's instructions. I need to get your contact info. And if the people are still that reluctant and they almost turn to you and say, so what, like I, I can't walk through the house? No, I'm sorry, you cannot. Unless I get your contact information, I cannot allow you to walk through the house. Now, you may be thinking right now, but Dave, the market's tough. We just established that they're like, they're ghost towns. So if I get anybody walking through, this is a good thing. I, I don't want to push them away. Look, I got you. But much the same. Don't you want their contact info? Do you just want some random stranger walking through your client's house? Do you think your client wants that? And again, do you want their contact info? Now, step into their shoes for a moment. They got in the house. They came all the way there from wherever they came from, but they made time to come. They're there. You think they just want to leave? See, they don't. So leverage that. Their fear of not being able to walk through the house, of having to leave after they came all the way there, that reluctance may just get them to give you the info. So we're kind of using three triggers here. One, we've got a sign-in mechanism with this incentive. Two, we're going to tell them seller's instructions. And three, we're going to instill some of that fear. That fear around the fact that they came there and they're not going to be able to go through it. So just a sidebar on that when we talk about meeting a new contact and we talk about these these open houses. Um, Think about that one the next time you're hosting an open house. But Let's think about this now. Let's go back on this and, and, and talk about the lack of action that's happening. Or, 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 or better yet, what do we need to know right now? We need to know, and, and some of this is like just obvious, but rates are up, so prices are slightly down. We know we've got a serious lack of inventory. We also know that there's some like very aggressive plans for a whole bunch of immigration. Like within the next 365 days. So we've got a serious lack of inventory. We've already got a housing problem. And now we're going to bring in more people. Which means what? Which means they're going to need more houses, more roofs over their heads. Which means we're going to continue to have a supply issue. Which means that prices will not really drop that low. See, think about it. As people wait for things to change, it becomes a catch-22. Money is hard to come by right now. Life is is like overall, like I, I don't even know if expensive is the word anymore. It's like, it's, it's, I, let's call it unaffordable. So we've got some, some real challenges out there. And let's look at a scenario. What happens if we wait for something to change? Which is, again, what we know people are doing at this moment. What happens if we wait for something to change? Well, rates go down. Prices go up. Rates go up. Prices come down even further. But we know that rates won't drop below a full point. We know that's not going to happen, right? They're, they're just To say that they're going to drop two points in the next 365 days, I think that's very hard-pressed to believe that that's going to happen. To say that they're even going to drop a point, I think that's also hard-pressed. But, you know, maybe a quarter point, maybe a half a point, even if it is a full point. Do you believe it'll be two full points? Like, what's going to be enough to move the needle for buyers? For people to get their hands on money. Who knows? But I'll tell you now, I think we can both agree rates aren't dropping that hard. Right? So if they're not, that means that it is going to remain difficult for people to get the money, which means that we're not going to have as many buyers out there. So what are people waiting for? Right? We're not going to see a big drop. And that's something we got to talk to our our clients about. It's not going to be major. 
Well, I'm going to see about the spring. Oh, just like everybody else is waiting for the spring. And the minute everybody decides to put their house on the on the market, even if rates haven't come down, what happens to the prices? Well, people are going to start trying to get a little bit more money. Why? Because they see that, hey, more people are doing it. And they're going to follow suit. And that's a big driver of what's happened in our market over the past number of years. As people, it's the sheeple mentality, right? That one that I talk about often. As people decide to list, other people go, oh, I'm going to list too. Now, you could argue that more inventory could give more way, you know, more options for buyers and therefore, you know, again, more buying power potentially. And hey, prices lowered. Yeah, but how much lower? And that's the whole thing. And that's why, again, this market, no matter what, the market is not going to crash. There's way too much demand. And for this moment in time right now, it's simply on pause. We simply don't have enough houses available. And so again, if it does become somewhat more affordable, prices are going to, like, like money becomes more affordable. Prices are in fact going to climb back up. And if things remain the same, which I believe they will for the next 12 to 36 months, again, we are going to see a lot of opportunity. So in saying this, your action step I think I said this already today. I think. (laughs) But do the things that I keep telling you to do. Have the conversations with your most important audience. Do your daily income producing activities. Push through the stuff that you don't want to do. It's the effort that you put in now to those small daily actions, which inevitably is going to set you up to get the results that you want. Okay, so again, what you do today is what's going to set you up for the results you want. So again, example, make the calls, send the newsletters. Yeah, but Dave, I don't don't know if I should be sending two newsletters a month. Okay, cool. So how about you send one? How about you don't send any? I mean, we don't want to bombard people. In fact, why don't you just get out of the business? Since you don't want people to know that you're in business. Since you don't want to build the mind share to get the market share. Since you don't want to position yourself as somebody who knows what's going on. No, no, Dave, I didn't say that. Well, what are you saying then? See, mix the business with the personal, okay? Strategically speaking, if you've got a newsletter going out, if you've got some content going out there on a regular basis, business-wise, let that happen. Then do the active touch points you need to do, like acting with purpose on social media, having conversations with people, Like I said a few minutes ago, meeting somebody new every single day. Those efforts, make your five, three to five phone calls. Those efforts are proven to set you up for success when this market turns. Proven. These are the things that agents are doing, top producing agents have been doing since day one. These are the things that when you continue to do, no matter what the market is doing, whether you're crazy busy running around to showings and listings and showings and listings, you don't think you have time to make the phone calls. Well, again, I'm going to tell you, think like a hunter. You want to make those calls because you want more business, more listings, more showings. Well, much the same. When you're not busy doing that stuff, listings and showings and running with clients, even more reason to make the calls and and to do the work that I'm telling you to do. So as we think about the number one factor here that's impacting your business right now, the market, think about what you can do to get out there and talk to people. Think about what you're doing on a daily basis to get out there and truly get that business that you want. Okay, factor number two here. Recent announcements from both Aurea and even NAR. We know that over the past few weeks, there's been some major, major uh, media coverage around the big lawsuit that just happened in the U.S. And it's got a lot of people wondering, how is this going to change the course of real estate for those of us working within it? Now, much the same up here in Canada, um, you know, specifically, I know, I know uh, um, Ontario, we've got Tressa. And this has a lot of people concerned as well. You know, will buyers be able to go at it alone? You know, will the open offer process hurt the industry? I'm going to tell you right now, I certainly, like, will say that that the the open offer process, it's not going to be benefiting the seller, right? They're not going to be able to get top dollar for that home. So why, like, I mean, buyers aren't going to spend as much if they know exactly what's going on. Like, if I, if I thought to myself, I'm going to spend, you know, I'm going to make an offer for $25,000 more, but I realize that I only have to offer another dollar, well, why wouldn't I do that? 
I can see it plain as day. It's clear as day. It's right there. So buyers just aren't going to spend as much money. So this is definitely going to hurt sellers. So I don't know why any seller would take advantage of doing an open offer process. I just, I personally, at this juncture, I don't see the benefit. We also, we also, and this is an important factor here. You've got to remember this. No matter what's going on with with what happened, you know, with NAR, what's going on with these these new options that buyers and sellers may have, we, the people working in this business, we know the ins and outs of the business. We know all the little details. We know what needs to be covered off in an agreement. We know what could spoil an agreement, what could tear one down. We know those little details that those buyers or sellers who think they can go at it on their own that may not be as well versed or versed at all in this type of sale, this type of purchase without the advice of a professional, we know how easy it is for them to get in trouble. And I'm talking like this could just be financial trouble where they make a a silly little mistake and all of a sudden it costs them thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. That's a lot of money. See, we have the knowledge for what to do to stay safe. They don't. Well, okay. You know, then then I get people that say, well, well, Dave, but my other concern is not just, you know, the knowledge around it, but like they, they've got all these requirements for paperwork, you know, things we need to get signed right off the top. I think it's going to scare people away. I'm not really comfortable getting them to sign it right away. Hey, <laughs> let me tell you something. Let me remind you of this. As per mandatory guidelines, like compliance, you're actually supposed to get those documents signed right off the top anyways. Again, it is mandatory. Plus, by not getting it signed, you're completely running the risk of doing all the work, but then maybe not getting the business, losing the client. Why would you ever do that? It's like, it doesn't make sense to me. Why would we go in and do all this work at the, at the you know, for the opportunity to to get a deal, yet not get a signature. Like if we don't put pen to paper, if there's no signature, there really is no client. There's no agreement. And in fact, you're going about it all wrong. So again, I get it. There's a fear, you know, a fear right now. Look, there's an overall fear of whether or not your role is going to change. That much I understand. And there's a fear around the processes and wondering whether or not this is all going to change forever. And yeah, there's changes coming, but you know what? Life changes and, and, and life is a cycle and, and there's, there's different things that happen and we just got to, we got to, you know, be ready to adapt. Much the same in this case, as you sit there worrying and wondering and fear mongering and forgive me, I have to say it. No, we're just, you know, paying attention to what's going on in our business. Look, I respect that. I understand that. I can appreciate that. But I'm going to go back to something that I always say on a regular basis. I've already said on this show today, time is of the essence. And there's only so much time in a day. And if you're going to spend your time through it a day just worrying, living in fear, procrastinating, wondering what if, how productive are you going to be? Yeah, but no, I know. we got to pay attention. Fine. Keep it in mind. In fact... Let's talk about an action step here. What do I do with this information? How do I get over the fear? How do I leverage this in a way to benefit me? How do I leverage this in a way to benefit others? Well, just like we've talked about, you know, for years upon years upon years, never, ever stop proving your value, okay? Always work to prove it every single day. How? Communicate to educate. Again, communicate to educate. Speak with your clients. Stay in touch with them. Share information with them. Let them know that you know. Let them know that you know more than they know. Keep in mind, they're busy too. They have a life. They may have a family. They've got responsibilities. How much time could they possibly put into going at this entire process by themselves? Much the same, too, as we talk about this thing called fear. Fear is one of the biggest motivators that anybody has in life. 
Fear will scare the shit out of somebody into doing something or not doing something. Straight up fear. So leveraging a little bit of fear, instilling a little bit of fear in people, it's not a bad thing. I mean, listen, think about what NAR, the, the whole NAR and Tressa thing are doing right now to our industry. It's instilling fear. It's getting you to think. Now, the other thing I want you to think about, it's either you or the media. So who's giving the better, who's spinning, who's sharing the better narrative? You or the media? Which one's more advantageous to you, to your clients, yours or the media's? Which one's going to serve you better, (laughs) yours or the media's? Of course, it's mine, Dave. Okay, cool. So let's go back to something we keep saying. We've got to get out there and we've got to talk to people, right? We've got to share the information, and as I went back in, 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 in factor number one, as we talked about the market, and I talked about doing your IPAs, and here we go for the 18th time on the show today, think about communication. When you're on the phone with people, talk to people. When you're sending your newsletters, make sure to let them know what's going on out there. When you're doing your social media posts, again, somehow we want to get the messages across. And a lot of this is spinning about the opportunities in real estate. A lot of this is looking at the, the positives and the advantages to people. Because all we're hearing right now is that the market is on hold. The market is slow. We know rates are up. Again, all these factors we've already talked about. I don't need to get back into them in in this segment of the show. But the point is we know these factors, these outside factors are impacting us. And if we don't communicate with our clients, then our clients' minds are going to think, well, that's what it is out there. But if we communicate to educate and we combat the narrative and we share where the opportunities are, And we share what's going on out there. And we share our knowledge. And we prove our value. We're going to get people understanding that that we have, again, value. We've got worth to this part of the process. And this is why you need us for this part of the process. Much the same. When you instill a little bit of fear and you share some stories with them. And this is part of your content strategy when we talk about instilling fear. Right? It's not about painting doom and gloom and the sky is falling. Moreover, think about stories. Think about, and again, action step here for a content strategy, right? Think about stories. Um, think about think about uh, uh, deals that you know that have gone bad or where people have gone out of their own and, and it has cost them, you know, lots of money. Don't make stuff up. Think about real situations and then just talk about them and leave the the finer details out of who and what and numbers. But you can talk about this stuff and just continue to kind of drip that into people's minds. Hey, you know, I remember a story about where somebody, you know, this happened to somebody and they thought they could do this. And then it ended up that, you know, something went wrong because of that and it cost them all sorts of money. And then all of a sudden the deal didn't go through. And again, we know these stories are real. We know there's there's lots of examples out there. Leverage that as part of your content strategy. Don't be the doom and gloom. Don't try to oversell the thing. But it's just another way to motivate people and make consumers and homeowners understand that, again, we as realtors have tremendous value in this process, and that's why you will continue to need us. And that's something I'm going to remind you about as well. You got to think about that. As long as you're out there on a daily educating yourself as well, and that, that's, again, part of what we do to schedule ourselves. What are you doing to feed your brain? And I've talked about listening to this podcast, which thank you. We talk about reading books. Much the same too. What about industry news? What about just looking up and understanding what the markets are doing and being able to, to relay that information back to your clients? And again, be the conduit of information. Be the person that they go to, that they trust, that they know has the advice for them that's looking out for their best interests. See, in most things we do, it's always nice to have help. It's always nice to work with other people. And if we've got other people there looking out for our best interests, other people are going to help us go through the process. Pardon me, we're looking out for their best interests and and we're going to help them go through the process. Forgive me. Then they're going to know that and they're going to trust you. And we know That is the know you, like you, trust you. That's where relationships are built and that's where deals and opportunities come from. So again, a running theme here today around when we look at these factors impacting our market, there's only so much we can do to control it. 
So again, your action step is to prove your value. Communicate to educate. And no matter what's going on with all this media, with all these these news updates and these, these changes coming in, instead of being fearful of them all, embrace them all. Start to navigate how you're going to make sure that people within your circle of influence, because again, as Johnny Goldmaker said when we talked about content creation, you only really need a true thousand real fans. You don't need millions. So your goal is to communicate to educate to those people. Think about your contact list. Think about the person. Think about the fact that you want to be the person they think of when they think about real estate. All right, factor number three here impacting your real estate business right now. It is business planning season. Now, I'm going to tell you, it is really up to you. It is your call if you decide that you want to walk into, you know, you want to roll into 2024 with a plan. Or if you want to continue to do the same as you've always done which may not be a whole heck of a lot. Now, you may think you're doing a lot because every single day you're running around and you're doing things and you're staying busy. But busy is just busy. We want that busy to be productive. So now is your time. Right now is your time to look over your business plan. Now is your time to review your expenses. Are you spending more money this year? Have you been spending less money this year? Look at your income. Did you make more or did you make less? Look ahead to next year and the possibility of how the market's going to be. And again, my prediction, it's going to be a tougher market in 24 than it was in 23. And we know 23 wasn't the best we've seen in, in, in a long time. So do you predict to make more? I mean, we all want to make more. But do we see the market being on fire again, or, or, or do we feel that we probably have to tighten up? So you're starting with income and expenses. You're figuring out what, well, I'd even say expenses. How much money goes out every single you know, month out of my pocket? Because, hey, if we get up to go to make money every single day and you know the reality is that we've got bills to pay, well, okay. So, again, how much money is going out every single day, or pardon me, every month? Figure that out. Once we understand how much is going out, then let's figure out what's coming in. So let's look at our income. Let's look at where the deals came from this past year. Let's look at, you know, what our splits were. And, we, you know, when we look at referrals and listings and buyers and maybe leases, you know, what did that look like? Then let's make some predictions for next year. Now we're going to get a sense of how much money we know is going to go out next year. We're also going to get a sense of how much money we, we, we anticipate to come in next year. And again, that we want to come in next year. Minimum that we need to come in next year. And that's a big one as well, is understanding what that number looks like. Once we understand what's going out, what's coming in, we can then just basically take that number, tally those, and get a good understanding of what do I have now available to me for things like... Um, savings, things like, you know, living. So not not just regular living expenses because we've already tracked those, but I'm talking like the extra stuff, the little fun stuff, the things that we want to do just because we want to. We feel we work hard. We want to be able to do this. And what kind of money do you have out of that pool right there also for your marketing? So you've got a few different things we got to look at. we got savings, we got living, and we got marketing. Well, how much money is available for that now? See, once we establish that, we can then look at our marketing plan. And that's what you need to be doing is looking at the marketing plan, setting a budget and asking yourself, what can I truly afford to spend on marketing for next year? And can I sustain that for the next 12 months, no matter what happens with this market? See, again, typically speaking, well, it depends if it works. Well, no, it doesn't. It depends if you can afford. So by calculating your numbers and understanding what you can afford to put to your marketing plan, Now, you craft a marketing plan that's going to be within that budget. Now, as part of your whole analyzing and your business planning and everything else, you look back on your deals and you understand where they came from. You understand what the biggest sources of and and the drivers of them all. And we track all this stuff. And then by doing that, we can tell, one, what marketing channels worked this past year. Where where was my most effective marketing? Which group was my business coming from? What else could I be doing to that group to be able to pull more dollars? 
and what wasn't working? Where did I spend money that I probably, well, I mean, it didn't work. Now, as a marketer, I am going to say to you that if you were spending for like 30 days or 60 days on something, you haven't given enough, enough time. But if you could backtrack that you've been spending, you know, money over the course of six or even 12 months, hey, review that. Can you afford to spend that money? Did that channel bring in any ROI? Even though you may want to do it, maybe it's not affordable right now. Maybe it's just not in the plans right now. So again, as a marketing plan, we want to ensure that the the channels we're using are driving business. We want to ensure that the channels we're using fit within our budget. And as we do all this, you know, we're adjusting cost to maximize ROI. And that's really the, you know, the be all and end all of why we're putting together a marketing plan. We want to, again, maximize, right? We want to maximize the ROI by bringing our, our costs down and focusing our efforts in the right places. Now, once we've got the marketing plan in place, now it's time to go over to goal setting. And with your goal setting, you want to you track a few things. One is what you want to do personally. Two is, you know, how much do you want to make? And then three is, how are you going to do it all? So you're breaking your goals out into a few different, you know, sort of three different sections of personal, income, and then action steps. And by tracking those goals, we can go through and ensure that on a regular basis, we're scheduling accordingly so that we're, you know, quote unquote, chipping away at the block on a daily basis, right? Minute by minute, as I said. So what am I doing in this half hour, this hour right now? And how is that driving the ultimate for what I want when it comes to my goals? This is something we do with our, our coaching clients on a regular basis. I mean, we've got all the, the the processes, the documents. We've got a whole plan for how we go through this stuff with everybody. And that's where, again, I I get to bask in the glory of watching people grow. Um, personally, like maybe that's self-serving. But like it's exciting for me to be able to watch my clients grow. You know, watch their money grow. Watch their personal, you know, accomplishments grow. To create that process for exactly how to do everything I just mentioned. Because again, as we look at, you know, factor number three, it is business planning time right now. This is the time where you need to be working on your business. See, those with a plan will find success. Those without will just keep doing the same thing. But nobody, nobody can afford to go into 2024 without a plan. So again, pro tip, action step, schedule time, listen to this one, schedule time to prioritize you. I had this thought, I don't know if it was this morning or last night, and it was just a random thought, and it kind of comes off wrong. So for those of you that, that, that are clients of mine, well, you'd already understand this. We've spoken about this. We, we talk about this all the time when it comes to goals, right? But we're always taught in business the client is always right, that the client comes first. And then we've gotten to this point in life where it's like, I I don't know how to say no. I always want to say yes. I always want to please everybody. Which then, then says, hey, the one thing you're not doing is you're not carving out your time properly because all you're doing is saying yes to everybody. So you're just taking on more and more and more and more and more. The other thing you're not doing is you're not focused on you. You always focus on pleasing them. Now, yes, there's a very important aspect to business of pleasing your clients and doing what you say you will do and then going above and beyond. I'm not going to say don't do that or, or take that away. What I am saying here, though, is when I talk about prioritizing you and this action step to prioritizing you, don't, don't keep yourself so preoccupied running for people and doing for people that when you look in the mirror, you get disappointed with yourself. That you're not happy with yourself. That you're not taking care of yourself. And I'm talking everything from, again, feeding your brain self-development to physical development of going out and working out or, or keeping yourself healthy. To brushing your own teeth. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, I didn't have time. I mean, think about it. There's a lot of little things we got to do to keep ourselves happy, to keep ourselves feeling good about who we are and, 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 you know, what we bring to the table, what we look like, how we feel. 
And this is not about for others. This is about for us. All those little goals you want to achieve. If we're constantly prioritizing our clients, if we're constantly putting them first, then when do we ever prioritize ourselves? When do we ever get what we want? So there's got to be a fine balance there. And this this is very much part of the definition of that whole work-life balance. There's got to be a fine balance in between how I manage my day to do everything that I want to do and more for my clients, because I love to do as much as I possibly can and more. I am incredibly dedicated to my clients. I also know for me that I got things I want to achieve. So I got to find that balance in life for how I'm going to manage it all. And that, again, is how we prioritize us. By going through this business planning, this this process I just explained to you. So as we, we move into the holiday season, you know, time is going to begin to fly. Goes without saying. Before we know it, it's going to be January. The market is what it is right now. The impact of the NAR lawsuit, as well as the implementation of Tressa, may have an effect. But if you don't plan to leave the business, then we need to focus. And well, without a plan, with without a business plan, it's going to be really hard to focus and therefore to achieve. So don't be like most people who, who, who are getting caught up in the drama, who get distracted by the noise. We all know this, and we've learned it over the, you know, ever since we were little. If you want something, you need to be the one to make it happen. No one is going to do it for you. So, to close out today's episode... We talked about the three factors that are impacting your real estate business right now. Factor number one was, again, people are on the fence. We talked about what to do about that. I gave you an action step there. And that was essentially to do your IPAs, map out your days, know what you got to accomplish, build that mind share. We talked about the recent announcement from both, again, Aria uh, and NAR, or pardon me, Rico. We talked about the, the Tressa. We talked about the NAR lawsuit. Again, noise. Don't let it get in there. Make sure you're doing what you got to do. Then we talked about, you know, business planning time. And once again, this came back and I outlined a system and a process for you. I outlined exactly the action steps you need to take. Today's episode was in an effort to help you understand what's impacting your business and how we're going to get past it to make 2024 your best year yet, no matter what that market is doing. And I will say to you, if you need help with any of it, I am right here for you. You're either listening to this on one of your favorite podcast platforms, or maybe you went to my website, mindshare101.com. And while you're there, be sure to download your free copy of the Ultimate Marketing Bundle, our 31 page ebook, including your free 90 day social media content counter to help you build more mindshares so that you get more market share. A reminder as well that if you want to talk about personalized one to one coaching, an in person keynote talk for your upcoming event, and or ongoing training, just get in touch with me. We'll set up a consultation call, learn more about what you're looking to achieve and how we are going to help you do just that. For all inquiries, just get in touch with us today. Of course, don't forget to leave a review of this podcast at www.ratethispodcast.com forward slash Mindshare 101. Uh, If you are on iTunes, go straight to iTunes. If you're on uh, an Android, go straight to Spotify. Um, And connect with me on Facebook at Mindshare 101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan 101. I want to thank Kids Keep In Touch Systems and REM Magazine for sponsoring the Mindshare podcast. Be sure to visit our site to learn more about what these powerful companies will do to help you grow your business. This has been another episode of the Mindshare podcast. Thank you for tuning in.